Hi everybody, it's Tim Hughes here. I'm the co-founder of the Digital Leadership Associates. I'm also the author of the book, Social Selling, Techniques to Influence Buyers and Changemakers. With me today is Liz from um, Rackspace. Liz. Yes, hello. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good to see you. Good. It's a good job that we don't have technical difficulties, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Well, they always say good things are worth waiting for, so hopefully. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> how are you? Good, wonderful. Good morning or good afternoon to you all. It's, it's afternoon for me, but morning for you. Absolutely. So, so, so tell everybody a little bit about yourself, what you do and, and, and what, your, what your responsibilities are. Sure. So um, at Rackspace, I, I like to joke that I... I am the sociologist because I happen to be the only one that does my job here. Um, and that's because I got to create my job. So uh, in about mid-2014, um, we started to see an opportunity for education for employees and incorporating into our social strategy. Um, and so I kind of raised my hand and volunteered to take on that challenge. Um, um, so sort of starting that, we began to build out an employee advocacy program. Um, okay. We founded and, and focused it heavily on tra training first, mm -hmm. sort of over time started to incorporate technologies into that. So we're almost two years strong into our program and okay. I've been really with the, the progress that we've made so far. So that's sort of my pet project is running that program globally. So, so before we go any further, um, mm -hmm. So, so, it, so, uh, for the people that are watching, where can uh, and I'll I'll ask this question again right at the end. Sure. Where can people get hold of you? Um, uh, I am primarily on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, LinkedIn's a little tough because you have to know how to spell my last name. Yes, that's, that's uh, pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I can I can spell that out for you all or um, provide some links. But Twitter is much easier. It's at creating Liz. Right. Okay. Fantastic. So. Um, Actually, we get a. Um, you, you're the second person that I've interviewed who have actually said they had to create the job themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I, I interviewed, um, uh, I, I interviewed Calvin Lee at uh, Thomson Reuters, and he has a very similar story in so much as he he was actually in a marketing role and it, and 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 he could see the competitive pressures around social and kind of put his hand up and and. Um, created the opportunity or was given the challenge, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> and I mean, is that, that, that's what happened with you. Yeah, I would say, I, I think see employee advocacy becoming sort of in the forefront over the last two years, but I think initially um, it very much was something that was sort of an afterthought and the focus was primarily on sort of the paid marketing initiatives. Um, mm -hmm. And so I I think we've seen opportunity evolve and so sort of naturally with that the role needed to evolve that somebody would sort of take that on as responsibility just yesterday i had a really interesting conversation because i think the the role of employee advocacy is going to evolve yet mm. again right living in marketing um, but i think we're seeing this real opportunity for employee engagement employee development additionally falls under HR and there's sort of a blending of these roles yeah. now um, with this sort of unique space around social media advocacy. So, so um, there's a couple of things I want to pick up on there because mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about um, employee advocacy but not right now. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you, you talked in your introduction about training. Yes. So, so talk us through the importance of training and why you went through, you did, you did that. So uh, it, it really started very organic. Actually, when we started training, I, I wanted to meet employees where they were at. And so the primary request that I get for training is around LinkedIn. And right. so I was like, great, that'll be an easy place to start. And so when I started training, I would do these 30 minute presentation um, as part of team meetings on sort of best practices on LinkedIn. Um, I did that for about six months when I found that there was option. So during the sessions, people would smile and nod and they'd be like, that's a great idea. And then when they went back to their desk, not much was happening. So I realized that there was some sort of gap. Something wasn't being covered in those and, 30 and that's minutes. Really interesting because I think that the, I meet a lot of very well-meaning people yeah. especially in marketing who, who kind of get social and therefore, and they're very passionate about it. And what they do is that they give very passionate uh, presentations around yep. best practice and then nothing happens. Yes, exactly my experience. So about six months after doing tons and tons of team meetings, I was like, something's not working. And what I realized, whole foundational conversation that needs to happen um, around 
addressing some of the fears and concerns employees have, um, I think this is where the confidence piece comes in is, you know, you can give all the best practices, examples that you want, but if that person doesn't feel quite ready or if they have some fears about putting themselves out there publicly, then all those tips and tricks are kind of for naught. And so that was sort of the step back that I took and said, wait, this can't be covered in 30 minutes. We need a little bit more time to dig into some of these questions and concerns, really give uh, employees practical steps that they can take to start to build that confidence. OK, because I, I kind of see and I'm just trying to get your whether you I kind of see that there's, there's been two tracks, mm -hmm. which is that there'll be people that get this and they'll fly. Yes. And then there'll be people that go, actually, and I'm really concerned and, and they'll be going, I, this scares me. Yes. And, and, and yeah. you know, I don't know I, this, you know, it's not natural for me to, to write a tweet or mm -hmm. whatever the thing is. Um, and 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 I don't know what to do. Right. And, and, I, and I kind of find that there's always this kind of two track where they're actually the best practices for these people. And they go off and all of a sudden they've got 1500 followers and they're like, you know, you know, <laughs> up, standing on these platforms at conferences. But there's right. a whole bunch of people, which are the majority that mm -hmm. are going, what's Buffer? What What's what? <laughs> And, I, and, yeah. and generally, I usually find I have to do the, the training for both. I mean, is that what you're right. finding? Absolutely. And and so I would say that's really why in that foundational course that we give employees options. So instead of just focusing on one social behavior, which is the sharing, and I think that's sort of the natural instinctive one for their sort of eager to get in and, and self-starters in that way. Um, but as you said, for the majority, we need to give them some options so they feel like they can participate. So the other two behaviors that we focus on are social listening. Right. Um, so just simply, you know, participating, listening to what's going on, listening to conversations that are relevant to their role um, or communities, and then engaging in meaningful conversations. Um, sharing content is only sort of one piece of the strategy. Whereas, you know, I might feel more comfortable having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, somebody who's talking about something I'm interested in, versus feeling like I have to craft a tweet or a post or a blog hmm. and and you said it's about behaviors yes. And, yes and 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 so so is it about behaviors or is it about at all that you're using um so i think i think the reason we focused on behaviors is because the the other element to talking about social media is worst talking to employees about how to use it on the job it feels like you're adding something to their plate yes and and we are all busy. We're all up to um, here in terms, yeah. in terms and, of work. <laughs> and so talk about a way to get people to shut down. It's like, I am booked all, it all day, and then you're asking me to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, there can be that initial sort of, please no. And so by, by talking about it as, as, hey, just try one thing per week even, um, just a simple little thing to add into the day, very minimal. Um, I think it... it starts to open up the conversation in a different way versus, hey, let's add social media into your work and, and kind of um, some of the, the other approaches that I've seen, it can end up feeling like a, like to an employee that you're doing more. And that feels yeah, a little so, overwhelming. So, I mean, are you advising people that, that actually they need to drop something during the day or, 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 or are you saying you need to take you need to take social media into the round? It's not this is not about saying here's another hour's worth of work to do during the day. Right. And I think that that's why we focus on it as a, a small behavior. Um, right. So it's it's something simple uh, add in. And the idea is more do it as a test. Test it and see. Do you yeah. see that it adds value? Do you you see that you get instant have otherwise great maybe you want to do more or say they test it and they're like this is just really not for me um the, we're sort of peer pressure people it's it's very much is it a value add test it try it incrementally start to gain momentum versus this whole new workflow that we're going to add to your plate so so when you when you're doing employee advocacy at uh, rackspace is this basically where you, you train people in using social and then you give them loads of um, corporate rack space stuff to basically pump out into the market? No, actually. Not that so anybody we, asked us that, you know. <laughs> never. What, I've, never I've never heard that. What's, so, what's rack so space, we, you know, a definition of employee advocacy? So we actually put it under the umbrella of employee development. Um, and so there's a huge piece of personal that comes into this. And that goes back to the confidence piece is um, before we want our employees out there and, and sort of sharing lots of content, we want they feel confident about how they're representing themselves online. Right. Um, so the second class that I offer is a, a LinkedIn 
workshop where I help them not only work through their LinkedIn profiles, but really get down to the heart of how do I want to represent myself online? So, what so, is the value that I bring? So this is about the employees yes. and not white space. Yeah, absolutely. And and that was a little pioneer, I would say. And um, there are those sort of initial fears that come up of, you know, are we just enabling employees to leave? Yeah. yeah, to go. I actually think we've seen the opposite. Um, employees feel invested in. Right. When you're investing in their professional development, um, mm -hmm. Um, and they think about how they're representing themselves online. I think it actually creates a sense of loyalty to the company. Right. Okay. That's that. That's interesting because I, I I sometimes once you get once the, the employees get over their fear of social, the managers then get. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're all going to go but you know if you if you're creating a great environment for for people and i think that if you're explaining to people that you're investing in them usually they, they go yeah I like this right i have a fantastic anecdote about that so uh, somebody who came through training updated his linkedin profile you know proud of his summary statement felt really good about it um, a colleague from a different company reached out to him and said i love your summary so just number one i love that interaction like how often have you heard somebody purposely reaching out just to say, I really love your summary statement. Uh, he responded, oh, thanks. It was part of this training that we did. And that person said, oh, would you recommend the vendor? Thinking mm -hmm. that that training had third party vendor. And with confidence, he was able to say, no, that's just the training that we're offered as employees. And so I think that's a perfect example of action of, you know, it, it really impressed that person that Backspace was investing in their employees in that way. And then and it made that really incredible that people were starting to notice um, how he was representing himself online. Mm, and, I, and I think, I mean, I've actually been, you know, there's a, there's a quote that goes around with, with me and where, where I've actually said that the em, employees now should be implementing social selling because they have a duty of care mm -hmm. to their employers, sorry, to their employees. The, 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 you know, the, 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 and, and if, if they're not implementing social selling, you kind of need to be, concerned that your company is going to be around. Mm -hmm. Well, funny story about sort of social selling from this personal branding uh, sense. So I've never been in sales myself. Um, I've always sort of been on the support side of things, customer support. But through this process of personal branding, um, I actually landed us a customer. Right. And so, you know, investing that time and setting up my profile in a way that seemed very helpful, very clear, very focused. Um, um, somebody reached out. You know, I have a question so, about. So let me, so let me yeah, get this. Ahead. You're in support. Yes. And you get a customer. Yep. So how mm -hmm. how talk me through how you did that? So again, it, it goes back to that step of I started investing in how I was representing myself online. Oh. Did that personal branding work where I really thought through like how do I want to represent myself? How do I want to clearly communicate? what I do um, and part of that was about being very helpful and so with that sort of tone of here's how I help you know please let me know if I can help somebody reached out to me they had a question about our hosted exchange product and I could help and so through that interaction um, we got up and they actually became a reseller right. and so that I always use that as an example if you looked at my quote social engagement rate it was one conversation, um, but again, the, the process to get to that point where that conversation could easily happen was all that in peace. And that's because you bought, you, you built up your, um, your trust and, and, and you were being authentic online and someone felt that they could come to you and ask you that question. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Super. Now, going back to something that you said earlier on was that there was this merger with with HR. Mm. I put out a blog uh, this week, which is something that I wrote a quite long time ago, which was about the fact that um, the, 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 the name of the blog is I'm in HR. Social selling has nothing to do with me, has it? And and I and I and I and I talk about an actual something that actually happened to me that some you know I had a headhunter ring me up and say, "Are you interested in this company?" And I went through the process. I looked at the website. And I couldn't understand it. It was written in, you know, marketing speak, copy gook. Um, and then I started looking up employees on LinkedIn, and they all had pretty rubbish profiles. And I thought, I don't want to work. Now, putting Glassdoor one side, which is where you could actually go and write up about, do, do you see there being this crossover or um, requirement now for HR to understand personal branding? Absolutely. Um, HR is definitely one of the uh, departments that I work very closely with for them. Um, oftentimes recruiters are your first touch point to a company um, and if they're sort of 
talking about the culture to represent that culture as well and give their perspective on it. And, and I, this, I think that's about externalizing. So Rackspace, Rack, yes. it, I've spoken to you and, and you have, a, a, you, you've articulated that Rackspace have a very particular culture. Yes. And it's about externalizing that on, on, on social. So in effect, you're, you're not just posting job ads, you're externalizing that culture to get people to come to you. Absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's personalizing it in a way that makes it tangible. Um, because one of the things I always, I always talk about is, like it or not, we're seeped in jargon depending on what industry you're in. And it, ha it happens to the best of us. You're in it sort of day in and day out. You start using these buzzwords. And then all of a sudden, you don't really know what that means. So when you say you're um, you know, driven and results oriented, it's like, how am I as a person that might not have any familiarity with your company, industry, really know what that means? And so that's sort of the challenge of personal branding is you're, you're sort of stepping out that you're in and saying, how would I explain this to somebody who has sort of no interaction with my company? Hmm. How, how, do I sh how would they be results oriented or driven or passionate? Or to your point about the culture, you know, we do have a very unique culture, but we put that into words that explain that to somebody who's never had an experience with our company. And that yeah. really is the opportunity to sort of on an individual personalized basis through employees. Yeah, my, my co-founder, Adam, tells his story because we quite often get asked by companies. We go in there and they say, what do you know about whatever they do? And we say, well, nothing. <laughs> and, 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 and isn't that actually the best thing? to be? Because what do your customers know about what you do? Well, nothing. Right. So, so aren't we the best people to actually translate and take all of the things and the passion that you have and actually put that out? into a blog or something like that because we're, because the more that we know about your products and services actually the less or the further we get away from the customer yes exactly and, and I, you know bringing it back around to the the selling with confidence i think the more that you're able to articulate um in ways kind of the the deeper meaning um the tangible examples behind what does what the value you personally bring to the process i think it does give you that confidence to then go out and and figure out how to get across the different social channels so then it becomes less about the tool of are you doing it on twitter or are you doing it on linkedin it becomes more, you can stand in confidence that i'm able to adapt that message to lots of different people because i really truly know what i mean when i say we do x y and z and so that's where the, I think, feel like the confidence piece comes in. And I would say a lot of other opportunities that we have to talk that way. Um, I think most of the training that you'll find in businesses is very, very product oriented. It's yeah. about widgets and features and functionalities. And it's not about internalizing and contextualizing the value that those products bring. Because you, you're, you're very keen, you, you tell me in your training, that, you're, that you get people to write with confidence and with clarity right and, right. and, 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 and it, to in effect use very very simple terms and to throw away all the jargon right and, and 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 you know the way i always usually measure it is if i try to explain to my mother what i do and she doesn't know yeah. what i do um, i've got a book and you know and, and and but you know she she is if i try and explain to her what i do it's kind of really it's it's, it's in those sorts of terms Right. Well, and the other thing is the process that I work employees through, I have them use their own words. Right. They're not taking sort of a marketing uh, statement and, and sort of twiddling with the words. They're actually putting it in their own words. And the reason I work them through that process is because then they're never afraid they're going to fall off script. Like right. if, if somebody asks them a question, they're never going to be caught off guard. They're, they they've took the time to put it in their own words. They have, again, that confidence that they they'll know how to, they'll be flexible with, with actively listening and being able to respond because it's all in their own words. So what about, I mean, what about rules? Do you, do you, do you set rules for people or do you, do you yeah. say, right, the, you know, the four, one, run rule or what, what, how do you go about that? I think that a, a couple fold. Absolutely. Um, we, we do as a, as a publicly traded company, we do have some, I call Call them our guardrail mm -hmm. guidelines that we have to play in. Um, we also do that a little bit differently. So, so is that like a, an in-house a tone of voice, or I mean, you know, there's some classic things like you can't, you, you shouldn't slag off the competitors. And, and right, right, yeah. So we we absolutely have those 
sort of policies and guidelines. And part of training what we do is I actually give employees examples. So right. it's not a, not enough to say, hey, here's the rule. It's like, what's going to look like in a tweet or a post? And so we actually work through an activity I call the good, the bad, and the gray. Right. Because employees can really quickly tell those good and bad, but it's all those ones in, in the middle that you kind of have to think through and have a couple strategies around. So I think once again, by giving real examples around those, we've found that employees are pretty able to sort of self-regulate. Um, so we, we work through, we absolutely set those examples for the good and bad, but then for the gray ones, we say, listen, you're going to have to practice some good judgment. We trust you to do that. And if you're not sure, here are your resources. Here's who you'd reach out to, to get that clarity. Right. And so I think it's about setting them up for success that, Hey, we trust you. There are going to be some situations that will just be different. They're not going to easily fall into another. Here's how you'd start to navigate some of those. And what do you do with the employees in terms of creating, of, of creating content and, and, and providing them with their own content? Or do they go and source it themselves or what happens? Sure. It's a little bit of both. So um, at base, we've got lots of different products and um, service offerings. And mm -hmm. so what we really do is encourage employees to say, what is about you? So as opposed to having them plug into sort of one central channel and maybe be bombarded with sort of everything throughout the business, we say, get really specific. What's going to be most relevant to you, your role, and then go and tap into that source there. So really encouraging them to based on their needs. Um, and then as for creating content, absolutely. And so the example I have with that is, I've been working with one of our teams, so a deeply technical team, not probably some, some team that you would intuitively think would be very social, but them options around social, all of a sudden the idea of creating content that they could proactively get to customers right. so that customers could have experience with their team was very appealing. And, and is this, so, so, so this is not just about salespeople. This is about taking subject matter experts, Right. pre sound people or, or people that that quite often you know people may not want to engage with salespeople. they may be at the top of the 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 the, uh, the funnel they're, they're out right. doing research but this is actually finding people that have an understanding and then engaging with them is that you're you're basically providing them with the the tools to to ena enable those engagements absolutely and and bringing them back into the sales cycle so think about we're getting the subject matter to actually create the content okay. and then how do you how, how how then can those sales reps leverage that content that again technical exports but is written with the customer in mind again right. it really starts to transform that sales experience that pushing jargon you're pushing this is going to be what your real experience is like when you're working with our storage team and I I think back to giving those tools, it makes it much more real for the customer and then enables that sales rep to have something that they can provide as a real clear example like to partner with our company. And, and that's, I think, as you're, you're, you can see that going through the pipe, because if you're providing those examples, the customer's going, it should be saying, these guys know their stuff, which is re really why we want to buy from them. Because, you know, Absolutely. always that, you know, I'm trying to sort it on a, on a, you know, the system's gone down on a Sunday afternoon. What am I going to do? Are, are these people going to step up? Um, and, and therefore, that would give you, as a salesperson, um, content to, to actually enable progression down the pipeline. Absolutely. And, and think about the shift that, that already that's done with providing real tangible examples, uh, feeling to be able to sort of navigate some of these conversations versus what I think tends to happen when the focus is just on sharing content. It becomes a very true experience. Yes. Because I think quite often with employee advocacy, it's all about taking the content that's being created somewhere in somewhere in, in the world and it's about pushing it out, mm -hmm. which for me is 1950s broadcast marketing <laughs> you know, in, in, in 2016. And, and it's kind of not, it, you know, we, we you know it should be a really, employee advocacy should be about it's about the employee mm -hmm. and how they can how they can be advocates for the business, not about how much stuff you can stuff out into the, the channel because you measured on employ you know, right. sale of voice. Well, and I, and I think one of the challenges, and I think we're all feeling it, is that the saturation. We're, yes. sat we're saturated with content. What we're not saturated with is good conversation. And, and we're always sort of craving connections of having a, 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 a real conversation of understanding that clarity piece. And I think that that, that really comes from deep internal work that you do through personal branding.
Mm. And and so so you have an example of, of of social selling where someone came to you and tried mm-hmm. to sell you an employee advocacy platform. There was two people. <laughs> yes. Why don't you share that? You know, it was it was neat that it happened almost within a week. Um, I had uh, one rep reach out to me. So we're in the process of evaluating employee advocacy tools. Um, that's definitely a natural progression of our, our program. And so sort of reached out to me, asked me a lot about my program, how we built it out, really wanted to understand where we were coming from. Uh, we both had a connection back to Spain. We ended up talking quite a bit about Madrid. Um, at the time, we were not in in a position to make a buy. Um, so that person understood, thanked me for my time, uh, did, you know, did the follow up and, and had a lovely experience. Uh, a week later, similar scenario got reached out to. Um, I felt like I was asked a series of very leading questions. The answer was going to be that their you know, yeah, 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 like the answer was going to be that their solution was going to save the day. Um, instead of really understand my program, and then none of the follow up happened. And right. so, just kind of comparing and contrasting, it, it kind of goes back to the person was trying to build a relationship with me, and mm-hmm. and really, I could tell felt the confidence that again, everything was in there being very authentic in the moment, able to sort of transition the conversation when that opportunity came up to talk about, again, something that was off topic, Madrid, but something I'm really passionate and love. But something that you had a connection over. Yes. 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 Connection on and and really able to connect on that level. Would they have found that on your LinkedIn profile? Um, Probably. Probably if you sort of think one of uh, one of my I'm last roles. Your surname and thinking uh, uh, that's not obviously <laughs> Spanish to me, but <laughs> yeah, it would not intuitive things that you would uh, think about me. But again, absolutely a connection. As you can see, it very much sparked my passion. The other experience, I felt I felt it was very transactional, which surprised me on an enterprise level. I mean, both shows, this is enterprise business, B two B. And it surprised me how transactional the second experience felt. I, 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 yes, I, I, there's, there's still people I think struggle with the B two B because sales cycles in B two B, you know, rack space must feel this are, are, are long and torturous, <laughs> uh, and, and and because it's not just one person making a decision, it's a it's an organisation. Right. And or a group of individuals, um, right? And, and 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 they can take a long time. And I think sometimes organisations, you know, it's the hundred dials people, and, and they're used to selling into this as the, the small business, and mm-hmm. then they move up into the enterprise, and they're still doing the hundred dials, right? They kind of expect to sell something over the phone. I I may be wrong, but that's quite often the. Well, and, and I think that you know my example of sort of those two contrasting experiences again. I wasn't at a, I was able to, or ready to make a buying decision, but yeah. I can tell you flat out who I would call when I am ready. Um, mm. And so I think that that's the difference. It is about making that shift to the focus on building those relationships. And to your point, when you get to an enterprise level, it's going to couple key relationships that you need to build, but they need to be really strong mm. to be able to get to that buying decision. And, and again, I think that this is where branding piece comes so important because you're going to have to translate your message to lots of different people to build those relationships strong enough to make that buying decision. Hmm. And and so so I've written something down in my notes where um, when we spoke before the call, and and, I, and I've written it and it says, "What is my ROI of a conference?" <laughs> and I can't remember what that was about. Well, and, and I th- been important. I've written it down. So I, th- I think that you kind of, you know, one of the questions I get asked often, because as we're talking through this, we can start to see like, wow, with pieces, again, it's, it's a, a, a lot of preparatory work to, to, to have those stars sort of aligned for that, those to come in. So it's kind of a, it's a long-term game when you start to build your presence online, build that trust and credibility. It can be hard when you're getting started. Um, and so there, initially, there's always that question of like, I kind of have to prove that it's worth it will bite and come in. And so there's always that ROI question. But I push back and I say, you know, we don't question the ROI of going and networking at a conference. Or using we, email. Yeah, or using email or calling on the phone. Um, and, it, it, and I think we should look at social media the same way. It's not going to be a one-for-one ROI. And I think when people go in with, 
with that attitude, that's where they need that it's not transactional. It's like, oh, I shared this piece of content. Why did I not get a deal immediately? Um, and so the question, it's like we, we, over time, we don't question going to conferences and networking in these other ways. Why do we still question ROI of social media and building right. networks there? And, and, are you, and are you seeing an ROI at Rackspace in terms of social selling? To say so. And I, I, again, I think it's, it's a longer term game, but, you know, anecdotally, I have heard from reps that, again, have put in the, on the personal branding, um, have really taken the time to build those relationships and those social behaviors that they are getting, that they are feeling more confident about the conversations that they're having. Um, and that same sort of circumstances, people are actually saying, oh my God, statement was incredible, or um, I completely knew what to expect when we were about to talk. And so it's sort of those antidotes that are building up over. I think overall, most businesses are challenged to be able to sort of nail down that number uh, because sales cycles are in a B2B business. It's really hard to say, hey, you shared this piece of content six months ago. And you won. And that, right. And that was one of the reasons that I sort of kept listening and following along. So I, I think that that's always going to be a challenge to sort of time. But absolutely, anecdotally, we've started to hear from reps that they've felt the value of it. And not only that, but they're telling it's like, hey, this is worth it. Um, I was I was pleased to see that we just had our sort of recap for the year and that my my classes are most attended classes that we have at Rackspace, meaning that month over month we are we are absolutely getting people coming back for more, more. and so that's been very encouraging. Right. Okay. Fantastic. So we're, we're just about uh, times up. So uh, can you um, um, we Liz? Can you tell us again where people can get hold of you and, and your share your your coordinates? Absolutely. So um, I do long. Long post, uh, long post blogging on LinkedIn, so you can check out some long posts there. I definitely cover some of these topics, and I'll spell it this time. So it's Elizabeth J R E W I C Z, um, and then find You're me on. Do that again, because you <laughs> went Dalek in the middle of it again. A little quick. It's J U R E W I C and Z. That's right. Okay. Um, and then if, if you want to find me on Twitter first, it's at creating Liz. So a little bit easier. And then you can link to my LinkedIn from there um, where I'm active and talking about um, a lot of these topics, employee advocacy. And if you don't mind, Tim, I, I always like to turn the table, mm -hmm. ask the interviewer a question, um, because you're obviously somebody who's invested in your personal brand and built yes. your trust and credibility if you don't mind sharing how did how did you sort of get started in that process was were you one of those self-motivated self starters or the way that you found yourself to have a well, I, brand? I, so i started in social media seven years ago when it was actually a manager at the time said you must do this <laughs> and, and of course i i ignore them because you generally do that with managers but then then finally i came kicking and screaming and joined twitter and i kind of played with it and it seemed to be you know i got a thousand fifteen hundred followers quite quickly um, wow. and, and, and I kind of kept playing with it and then um, I, I suddenly started realizing certainly when I got over about five thousand followers that there was a there was something here and and um, I, I, I I went along and I, I kind of did things where I, I was always I, I, I've always chased followers um, which is the wrong thing to do, I know. But uh, what was happening was that there was these lists coming, and this is sounds this is a real vanity thing. <laughs> lists were coming over from the states, and I wasn't on them, and and I wanted to know why, and I couldn't understand it. So I, I and um, and it was mainly because they were actually produced by mates, and they were producing lists with their other um, uh, um, U.S. mates on it. Um, but I, I, I therefore was looking for things that I could do to increase my. Um, my amplification and, and what I was what I was doing. So I went on a blogging course and I started writing about two years ago, which is really difficult for me because I didn't see myself as a writer. And then I, you know, I pitched for a book and, you know, here I am now and, you know, and, you know, it's a, a best-selling book um, on Amazon. Um, and, and so it's kind of, it's, it's, there's never been a, there's never been a, in the back of my mind, this is where I want to go. Mm -hmm. but, I've generally found that that whatever you do leads to something else. Mm -hmm. So being on social led to me blogging. Blogging led me to be an author. Mm -hmm. um, I've met home, um, you know, all kinds of people who've now become friends, and and some amazing people that I wouldn't have met through social. 
Um, and, you know, I get to go and speak and meet all kinds of people. And it's it's an amazing thing. And I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change anything. It's not really answered your question. It was never something I never decided that I wanted to be this person with 100 and nearly 160,000 followers and a best selling author. It kind of took its own momentum. Um, but I, from a sales perspective, being in sales now for 27 years, I don't understand why people aren't doing it. Mm -hmm. Because because I get daily inbound, right? I I constantly getting people. Can you do this? Can you do this? Whatever. And why they may not ch turn into anything, the, the fact is that people are having a conversation with you, and the fact that I'm out there, people understand. You know, I got someone came to me last night and said, you know, you're you come across as one of the top social sellers, and he wrote to him, well, right. I am the top social seller, something like <laughs> not the, you know one of. Um, and, 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 you know, you, if, it doesn't matter what you sell, but you should be in a position where you are that person. So, I'm, you know, if you sell, and I, and I don't know what, you know, if you sell, what do you say, storage or something in Rackspace, you know, you want to be, you know, you should, as a salesperson, be the, the Mr. or Mrs. storage for the global. You should be known for that. Right. And I, and I wouldn't, and I don't understand why you wouldn't want to. Right, because absolutely. We will get inbound. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you, you will get asked to present at conferences and you may talk, you, you may, you, you, you're, you know, the conversations that, or the presentations that I give aren't necessarily about my company, but I, but I get a free advert because of the fact that I, I, I represent that. Yeah. And that's what you would get. And you, you're, you've got the ability in social to really create something and, and also, you said something about experimentation. I recommend that people experiment because you can you can kind of move blogs around by changing the words or the 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 the, 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 the titles or where you aim them or all kinds of things, and you can move it around on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an advanced in advanced um, uh, uh, trick, but you can do that and move it to different places on LinkedIn to put it in front of the people that may not be your customers, but you'd like to them to be your customers. Right. And if you don't mind, I have one little follow-up question, just because yeah. I love here the sales perspective. Because again, I think not coming from sales, that's a, a, a source of um, opportunity for me to gain a little credibility. But I, I love what you said. You, you confess that initially you were looking for those followers. And I think that that's the temptation is like followers or likes. What would you, in hindsight, maybe do differently and, and possibly recommend for a rep that is getting started now? Like what with that, that knowledge that you've gained, what would so, you recommend? So, 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 so fo you, followers aren't, aren't, aren't something that you, 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 you need. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I've, I've written a blog um, from a, a friend of mine who I interviewed who's getting 10 C-level meetings a week using Twitter. That, that blog's on my LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote that. Uh, with Paul two years ago, so that's not something that he suddenly started doing. He was doing it, doing it two years ago, and he's at the time of writing. It actually says in the blog because I wanted to. I think it was about four hundred and fifty followers. Um, we're currently doing some work for a, um, an IBM partner where we're basically running the social for them, and their sales director's got two thousand followers. But by the way that we're running it, he's got more impressions and getting more retweets than I am, mm. and is getting and, and is getting far more amplification. So it's, it's not necessarily the number of followers that you have that allows you to to, to get the amplification uh, and the the ability to 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 um, reach your your customers and your prospects. If you you're selling something like storage, which is a very very small niche, how many people are are, are there in your territory, or probably? Mm. You know, just outside your territory, because you've got to remember that actually influence may be outside your territory. For right. example, for example, um, you may be calling upon an organization A, but the person who's actually influencing that sale may have left and is at company B. Because they right. may be ringing them up and saying, Fred, you know, you've dealt with this company. What do you think? So it's, it's not just about your territory. It may actually be outside of that. So your territory may, you know, maybe just um, South New York or Pennsylvania or something like that. So you only need to own that. And all we're doing and all I talk about in my book is about how we lift or how I manage my territory in the analog world and lift it into the digital world. Right.
So I know exactly what's going on. I always knew what was going on in my territory. I knew if competitors were coming in and I knew what my competitors were doing. I now do that because I'm listening on social. I'm watching them on social mm. and I'm and I'm hearing what they're doing. And I'm talking to my customers and I, my, my customer, you know, they're engaging with my customers just as much as I am. And I'm talking to my customers just as much as any salesperson would. But I know what's going on in my territory through social as, yeah. as well as obviously talking to people. And it's about making that switch. Right. Well, and thank you. That's, that's, like, that's such big validation for the, the importance of social listening and also the accessibility of social listening. Again, it doesn't, um, you're not putting yourself out there too much just by listening and, and getting started there by learning and, and gaining those insights. And actually by listening, it, it, as you mentioned, it facilitates those conversations. It yes. makes you feel more confident that you can actually jump in and, and add something of value to a conversation conversation so loving to hear and, and i really appreciate you sharing so so liz thank you very much for the um, um for the chat thank you for the uh, the interview um and um and happy social selling thank thanks so much. much really appreciate it thanks liz bye bye